This is a revision PowerPoint for Theme 5 for Year 11 GCC Weather, Climate and Ecosystems. The pupils have put together a series of revision A3 sheets, which you can see on each slide, and also I'll uh, overview a few other little concepts that may or may not have been missed. The first one, Theme 5.1.1, what's the evidence for climate change? Here, you need to look at climate change in terms of the cyclical nature of glacial and interglacial periods. Interglacial periods have uh, occurred um, about every 10,000 years, uh, and we've noticed this since the past 420,000 years. There are also other cycles of change. Uh, there are changes as a result of uh, something called the Milankovitch cycles, and also we've had uh, some very small interglacial periods, for example, uh, the medieval uh, period, which was uh, probably about 400,000 years ago. Milankovitch cycles are those warmer and cooler periods which are caused by the orbit of the Earth. Uh, sometimes it's closer and sometimes it's further away from the Sun. The tilt of the Sun affects the amount of energy it receives as well. Um, you need to have uh, an understanding about um, evidence as well for the various bits of climate change that might crop up in the exam. For example, tree rings. Uh, tree rings, uh, obviously, when you cut through a stump or a tree, uh, show an annual tree growth. Now, if the, the rings are very close together, it means it was particularly cold because the tree didn't grow very fast at all. If they're very far apart, that means the tree grew rather rapidly. Now, if you know which species it is and what its uh, growth rate is like now, you can radiocarbon date those trees, those tree stumps, and they give an indication of how cold it was during that period of time, given the expected growth. You also need to uh, have an understanding about ice cores and what evidence they show. Ice cores are massive cylinders which are withdrawn from Arctic, Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets, and they contain with them bits of atmospheric salt and dust, which can show when industrial revolutions have taken place. And also they have small, tiny bubbles of gas. Now, we know from the depth of the ice, when the ice was laid down, so we can date the actual piece of ice in these massive long cylinders. So therefore, we can look at these gas bubbles and look at the concentration of carbon dioxide in them, and that will indicate how much carbon there was in the atmosphere at that time, because there are direct links with the amount of carbon in the atmosphere and atmospheric temperatures as well. Okay, 5.1.2 are about all the causes of climate change. Um, you'll also need to know about flows and stores of carbon in the carbon cycle and the things which link those stores. Um, you need to have an understanding about the greenhouse effect as well, which I'll very, very briefly go over now. Um, the greenhouse effect uh, keeps us alive. If it wasn't for that, our planet would be uninhabitable. And it's, uh, it's been exacerbated by human activity, the burning of coal, oil and gas, intensive farming, uh, the release of methane from... Uh, from peak decomposition and also from the Arctic tundra. Essentially, um, solar energy comes in from the atmosphere. Now, as this shortwave energy passes through the atmosphere, it may hit dust particles or water droplets and be scattered or reflected back out into space. Only a little shortwave radiation is absorbed by the atmosphere. Uh, solar energy then heats up the Earth's surface, which then radiates long wave or heat energy into the atmosphere. That keeps us warm. Some of that long wave energy escapes into space. Now, long wave energy is quite easily absorbed by naturally occurring greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Of these, carbon, uh, carbon dioxide is the most abundant, but you've also got water vapour as well, and other things like nitric oxide, sulphur dioxide, carbon monoxide, which are all in the atmosphere. Um, now, that's uh, obviously exacerbated by human activity, but there are you know, natural periods of warming and cooling uh, and we have detected this over you know several hundred thousand years we have glacials and interglacials which you know we we have observed through uh, records of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and also from tree ring growth so it is a natural thing but exacerbated by human activity you need also a, an understanding of uh, the carbon cycle the carbon cycle involves um, stores of carbon, the movement of carbon, uh, effectively transfers of carbon. Um, carbon could be stored in sediments, in the oceans and in deep water.
carbon could be stored in the soil, carbon could be stored in the atmosphere, carbon could be stored in vegetation. Now, obviously, if you're taking uh, rocks out of the ground, for example, coal, which is a, a store of almost pure carbon, and you're burning that, you're releasing that carbon. It's a very fast release of carbon. Now, that carbon then goes into the atmosphere where it is stored. It is stored for uh, a shorter period of time, and the majority of it is uh, absorbed by surface water in the sea. It's dissolved. Now, that carbon will make the, the seawater slightly acidic, carbonic acid. However, some of that carbon will then be given back to the atmosphere. So it's absorbed by surface water and it's also given back as degassing. Uh, some of the carbon then in the ocean will then be stored as sediment. Uh, and this over a period of time uh, will slowly be uh, locked in or sequestered, which is a very, very slow transfer. Um, some of the, the carbon in the atmosphere as well will also fall on, uh, directly onto the ground and be absorbed by the soil. It'll be sequestered by the soil. Now, plants also will be able to release carbon during um, respiration. Uh, respiration occurs generally at night time. It is uh, when carbon dioxide is given out and oxygen is taken in. It's almost like the opposite of photosynthesis, which is the absorption of oxygen, um, is the giving out of oxygen and the creation of oxygen by photosynthesis. And the plant then locks in carbon and uses it for uh, its own um, life processes and also the building blocks for the actual plant itself. Um, you can see from the sheets, you know, a variety of different notes as well. But I'll flick forward. I don't want to waffle on for ages about this. OK, 5.2.1 is also about um, weather, weather consequences, low pressure and high pressure as well. Um, think about low pressure in terms of low, it may blow, it may rain, it may snow. Low pressure is not particularly nice weather. High pressure, high and dry, nice clear sky. High pressure is nice weather. You can get low pressure in the summer and winter. You can get high pressure in the summer and winter, but they're both slightly different. Low pressure is associated with um, rainfall and winds. Uh, low pressure it occurs where you've got rising air. Rising air gets cooler. Any moisture in that air will condense and form clouds and rainfall will ensue. In Great Britain, we get a lot of low pressure systems moving off the Atlantic from um, the direction of the Gulf of Mexico brought along by the uh, North Atlantic Drift. And we get this frontal rainfall hitting Great Britain where you've got a warm front first and then a period of warm and then you've got the cold front. Both fronts are associated with rainfall. On a weather map, you've got isobars which are very tight together and these things uh, move in an anti-clockwise fashion. It almost looks like a shark's fin on a, on a weather map. Uh, low pressure can also be caused where the sun is directly overhead, called the Intertropical Convergence Zone, ITCZ. Uh, this is where the sun, if you like, moves slightly north and slightly south of the equator at different seasons in the year. Of course, the sun doesn't move. It's because of the tilt of the Earth as the Earth rotates around the sun, giving us our four seasons. The location of this ITCZ changes let's say every three months. So in winter, in December, when we've got our winter, it's the maximum extent of the journey of the sun in the southern hemisphere, which is when they get their summer. Now, obviously, six months later, at the peak of our summer in June, when we get the maximum overhead sunshine in the southern hemisphere, let's say Australia, that's when they have their winter. Now, that's six months apart. That means it's on its journey. So that means three months later is bang on at the equator. So in our spring, and in our autumn, the sun, or the ITCZ rather, is located directly overhead at zero degrees, where low pressure is. Now, wherever you get the ITCZ, you get low pressure. Low pressure brings with it rainfall, because the sun shines directly overhead, makes water at the surface of the sea evaporate, and then this evaporating water is forced to rise, it cools, condenses, forms clouds, and rainfalls ensue. Now, this will bring with it, um, as it migrates north, the ICCZ, this will bring with it rainfall, and in some areas it's called the monsoon rainfall. Okay, particularly in areas of India where you get monsoon rainfall. Now, sometimes the monsoon rains don't come because of uh, a big area of high pressure which stops uh, the low pressure moving in. These high pressure systems are called blocking highs, and that means um, it will lead to areas of uh, drought. Now, this drought you'll be seeing in your case study notes looking at the Sahel in northern Africa, which is a band of spread of desert-like conditions, which covers many of the African countries north of the equator, 
like Chad, Ethiopia, Kenya. Now, these are dominated by a high pressure zone, but you should get annually the migration of the ITCZ bringing uh, moisture. But because of the continentality, because Africa is so massive and blocking highs, it sometimes doesn't occur there. Now, in the Sahel, you will get this dominant high pressure and sometimes monsoon rainfalls aren't coming. So you, you get the spread of desert like conditions. So no rain, drought, crops fail, uh, the soil becomes eroded. It then is eroded by the wind. It's, uh, it's baked by the sun. So any rain which does fall on it will then not be absorbed into the ground and will go directly into water courses and, and just drain off the land. Uh, obviously, people have still got to live. So they, they still keep animals on the ground. But any vegetation that is there is soon gobbled up by the animals. So you get overgrazing. You'll also have people wanting to still grow crops. So you'll have overcultivation. And then this will lead to a change in the small climate of the area that as the vegetation is removed, livestock will die, which is an economic impact. And then people obviously will start to die as well or migrate to areas where there is a guaranteed food supply. So, for example, from more continental Kenya or Ethiopia, you may travel to more coastal areas like uh, like Mombasa in Kenya or to the capital city, Nairobi where you've got a more secure supply of water, maybe education, maybe food and healthcare for your family as well. But this is being uh, counteracted by uh, the greening of Africa, the, uh, the green belts of Africa, where people are trying to plant uh, a massive mile wide uh, band of trees, which will hopefully influence climate in the area. OK, looking on to 5.2.2, looking at factors which create variations in the weather, uh, and climate at different scales within the UK. Um, weather is the day-to-day -day condition of the atmosphere and the environment outside. Rain, sun, hail, sleet, snow, wind. And, and it changes day by day. Climate is the average of these. So you wouldn't say um, the climate outside today is sunny. You would describe the climate as being what it's like over a long period of time. So you might say the climate of the south of Spain. It's hot and sunny. That's the general climate, but the weather there today might actually be rainy because the climate is an average weather and climate over a long period of time. Um, one of the big impacts on climate is latitude, which is the distance from the equator. Those lines on a globe or on a weather map which are parallel to the equator. Now, there are two reasons why it gets colder the further north or south you go away from the equator. And they are, firstly, because the sun's energy has to travel through more atmosphere and the sun's energy is absorbed by bits of dust, water vapour in the atmosphere and by the time it reaches the ground some of that will be in the atmosphere and it won't all be absorbed by the ground. So that's number one. And number two is because of the angle that the sun hits the ground. Uh, discussed the ITCZ before, in spring and in autumn the sun is directly overhead at the equator, very little atmosphere to go through, maximum concentration of heat energy. As the ITCZ moves further north then the sun is more directly overhead and as a result of that, more solar energy reaches the ground. A little bit like our winters, the sun or the ITCZ is in the southern hemisphere. So it's not very directly overhead for us. It's not 90 degrees like it is in spring and autumn at the equator. You know, it's considerably much more oblique than that. So it's got a lot of atmosphere to go through. So latitude has a big influence. That's why Scotland is colder than Kent in the south of England. Um, you also need uh, an understanding about altitude and how that affects climate. Mountainous areas are colder. Anywhere which is lower down is warmer. When it's colder, you get more condensation and more rainfall and more clouds. If you've got more clouds, less sunlight gets through. If it's lower down, it's warmer. The ground doesn't have uh, the ground absorbs more heat and re-radiates it to the atmosphere around. Also, the air pressure is different. The pressure at the top of a mountain is different to the pressure at the bottom of a mountain. And as a result of that, the ability for the atmosphere to store incoming heat is much, much more compromised. Um, ocean currents also have a, a big effect on temperature in the United Kingdom. The west coast of the United Kingdom is warmer and wetter as a result of the Gulf Stream, sometimes called the North Atlantic Drift. Now, obviously, the east coast isn't influenced by this. So it's slightly drier in the east, which is a good thing. But also in the winter, it's colder. The east coast of Great Britain is colder than the west coast of Great Britain. Yes, the west coast does get more cloud and rain, but it's warmer. So this ocean currents keeps the west coast warmer and also slightly wetter, which is great for agriculture, but it's not necessarily great for tourism, link it into other areas. Uh, in the winter, so it's warmer and wetter. In the summer, because of the clouds, it's slightly cooler and wetter. So, And, that, and the opposite occurs on the east coast. Uh, 
Um, with regards to uh, rainfall in the United Kingdom, most of our rainfall is frontal rainfall, where you get a warm and cold front moving towards an area of cooler land or sea or ocean or air, and it's forced to rise and condensation occurs and you get rainfall. Um, low pressure in the UK in the summer causes uh, rain, cloud, slightly cooler. And in the winter, it might fall as snow, particularly over highlands or in the north in Scotland. High pressure in the winter will cause frost, fog, clear skies, very, very cold at night. In the summer, it can cause heat wave, beautiful sunny skies, high and dry, nice, clear sky. Remember about that. Um, in terms of maritime and continental climate, then, um, areas which are close to the sea, okay, are classed as maritime. Now, in the summer, it means the breezes coming over the sea cool down those coastal areas. And in the winter, those breezes warm up those coastal areas. Further inland, it's always the opposite. So that means in the summer, they don't get the cool breezes inland, so it's nice and cold. It's nice and hot, I beg your pardon. And then in the, uh, in the winter, they don't get the warming breezes on the coast, so it's really, really cold inland. So continental areas are very cold in the winter and much warmer in the summer. Um, in terms of microclimate, then, you've got a few things that you need to bear in mind. Um, dark surfaces are much, much hotter. So if you've got tarmac, it absorbs heat. So cities and towns will have lots of this tarmac, so they will absorb heat and re-radiate it to the environment around. In addition to that, you'll have the funneling effect by high-rise blocks. Think of Mostyn Street, the way the, the, the wind just zooms down there. Between buildings, you'll have eddying of the wind as well. Um, You'll have some areas which are forested, and these forested areas, they will actually act as a, a regulator of temperature. In the daytime, these forest areas will give off cool air from underneath the canopy, and that will cool the surrounding area. And the flip side of that, at night time, any warmth that they've uh, absorbed will then be giving out. So they naturally regulate the climate. Um, looking at large-scale ecosystems, then, you've got a few different ecosystems for 5.3.1 to look at. Ecosystem change according to latitude, really. At zero degrees, you're going to get tropical rainforests. Moving away from that, uh, you're then going to get the, the grasslands, the savannas, as you move into Africa. Further north in Africa, you're going to get the desert. Moving across the Mediterranean Sea, uh, then you'll get the Mediterranean climate. Moving further north, you'll get our climate, which... Although we're an island, so we've got a temperate maritime climate, is is typical of a mixed oak deciduous woodland climate. Further north again, you've got the belt of coniferous forest around the world called the taiga, which is the largest unbroken uh, belt. Further north of that, temperatures are really cold and it's only sunny for a few months a year, so you get the the um, the Arctic tundra, and then above that, it is Arctic. So at the uh, at the zero degrees, you've got lots of sunlight, dominated by low pressure, so lots of moisture, lots of sunlight, ideal for vegetation like jungle uh, to be found. Um, moving further north to savannah, where high pressure dominates and you get monsoon rainfall, then the type of vegetation is going to change from being jungle and trees to, to grassland. Okay, moving forward then to 5.3.2, looking at the key processes of ecosystems at uh, different scales. You, you need to be aware here of the living and the non-living parts of the environment and interactions between them. Living components, like, for example, uh, the producers, which are the, the plants which photosynthesize, they're living. They are then predated upon by the herbivores, uh, things which nibble on them, the vegetarians, if you like, the primary consumers. These, in turn, are eaten by secondary consumers. Uh, so this, this then could be a, an omnivore of some kind. And then you'll usually have a, a, a tertiary or top predator, which is usually a carnivore or, partic or could be a, an omnivore again. They're all living components of the ecosystem. So you've got plants and animals, basically, are living. They're biotic. Things which are abiotic, which are non-living components of the ecosystem, uh, heat, sun, rain. You've got nutrients in the soil, moisture in the soil. Uh, you've got the soil itself, rocks, uh, and temperature. They're all non-living components of the, the ecosystem. You'll have interactions between them, and you'll have food chains. You need to make sure you've revised uh, food chains as well. Um, 5.4.1, then. In 5.4.1, you're looking at how do people use ecosystems and environments for food, energy, and water. 
So environments that we use for food, tropical rainforests, for example, a good sustainable use of the tropical rainforest is agroforestry, where you keep the trees, uh, but then you gra uh, graze animals and grow crops underneath it. Very, very sustainable, very, very environmentally friendly. And this is a very good way of using the environment for food. However, you can also use the tropical rainforest unsustainably for food by clearing whole areas of land for cattle ranching. They did this in the 80s to provide beef for beef burgers for McDonald's. Really unsustainable use. They've also used the tropical rainforest to grow one type of plant in order to um, generate fuel for cars, which is ethanol via sh planting sugar, which is a type of food, but it's not eaten, it's used to ferment for bioethanol for cars in Brazil. In addition to that, in the tropical rainforest, they've also uh, planted palm and palm oil. It's in the news a lot about the orangutan uh, loss of habitats at the moment, isn't it? But this palm oil is used to bulk out foods like Nutella, for example, uh, when it's not really particularly good for the environment at all. It's one crop, so the ecosystem completely breaks down. The nutrients which are stored in the trees, not the soil or the litter layer, are completely removed as well. Uh, we also use the environment for energy. For example, uh, Gwintermoor, which is off the coast of uh, North Wales, providing clean electric uh, via harnessing the power of the wind, which is very good because no coal, oil and gas is burnt. So you get no greenhouse emissions, but some people think they look ugly. Some people think that they interfere with the migration patterns of fish and they do kill birds. And uh, some people say that on windless days, they're generating no electricity. So you do need to have other backups in place as well. Um, so we also use water, therefore, for Gwintermoor, but we also use it for hydroelectricity power. Um, and you've got some case studies of that and also to, to look through as well. 5.4.2 is looking at how we modify processes and interactions within ecosystems. Um, it's how we use the ecosystems as well. So we use the tropical rainforest, as you can see on the diagram for food. There are, there are some great uh, solutions on the screen here. Um, some things like agroforestry, planting crops under the trees, uh, getting the indigenous people involved in using and selling and maintaining and harvesting uh, fruits, nuts, berries in the tropical rainforest as well. Um, obviously, if you remove elements of the tropical rainforest, particularly the timber, the flow of nutrients completely changes and you're taking carbon, uh, which could then be burnt or could then be uh, broken down if it's, if it's burnt and that goes into the environment. Um, 5.4.3, looking at ecosystem management. Um, you need to have a sustainable strategy to manage the habitat and biodiversity in tropical rainforest and one contrasting ecosystem, which could be the same one. So for example, I've, I've talked about agroforestry in the tropical rainforest. You could also have national parks in the tropical rainforest as well. And now this can also go for the savanna, looking at national parks, creating areas where no hunting is allowed, no poaching is allowed. And then the savanna is enabled, enabled to um, continue uh, its growth and its succession um, sustainably. One other way of developing savanna land and also tropical rainforest land is the use of ecotourism, where you encourage tourists to visit an area, you control their numbers, you educate them to make sure that they will be looking after the ecosystem and not damaging it. Uh, you make sure small numbers of people are invited into the ecosystem, for example, a savanna. You take them on tours and land rovers to observe the wildlife, not shooting it, and then it's not trophy hunting. And then the money goes to the local people as they're employed. It goes to help fund education systems. It go goes to fund sanitation and uh, the provision of fresh water and sewerage for local people. And also to help educate local people, help improve literacy standards, and also to help educate them about the importance and the significance of the ecosystem that you're, uh, you're trying to protect as well. You can see some other ones about sustainable um, protection of ecosystems on the screen, but I shan't go over all of that.